All right, let's pray and we will get started. Lord Jesus, help us to grow in the knowledge of your word and in your saving work for us and to remain firm in the confession of your blessed word. Give us love to be of one mind and to serve one another in you. Then we will not be afraid of that which is disagreeable, nor of the rage of the arsonist Satan, whose torch is almost extinguished. Dear Father, guard us so that his craftiness may not take the place of our pure faith. Grant that our cross and suffering may lead to a blessed and sure hope of the coming of our Savior Jesus Christ, for whom we wait daily. Amen. All right, as is our practice, are there any questions that cropped up as a result of the sermon? I don't see anybody jumping here, chomping at the bit. Either I confused everybody or it was just crystal clear. (laughs) Probably the first. Not your fault, I'm easily confused. (laughs) Thanks, Mark. Thank you. I appreciate you helping me understand what the silence is really about. I have a hard time interpreting it. All right, hearing no questions then, we're going to take, we're going to continue walking through the... um, the book of Leviticus. We're up to Leviticus 19.32. And again, just a reminder, we're dealing with law. Um, and so a right understanding of God's law, it convicts us of our sins. Uh, the, the government uses it for the purpose of curbing evil. And it also shows us what a good work is. And I'm going to make an important distinction here. Oftentimes, when we look at the commandments, we have this weird ornery thing that we do. And that is is that as we're reading the commandments, we say something like, oh, I wish so-and-so could see this. (laughs) And um, (laughs) apparently I've uh, let the cat out of the bag. So so the, the issue is this, is the third use of the law, when God is showing you what a good work is, it applies to you. It's for you, <laughs> okay? And, uh, and the idea is let God's law work in your, in your neighbor uh, and, and don't play Holy Spirit for that person. Does that make sense? So the idea here is if you're reading these commandments and you're sitting there going, man, I really wish... You no, the question is, what is this commandment saying to you? All right? I always find it fascinating that the people who read God's law as if it doesn't seem to apply to them or has nothing to say to them, how much they end up breaking the commandments. You know, in the name of helping somebody else, they end up breaking the Eighth Commandment egregiously and uh, slander people and other things like that. So, so primarily when we, when we hear God's law, I always like to kind of put it this way, and that is, is that when I preach the law, I have no clue what God is going to do with it. No, no clue whatsoever. And when it comes to the uses of the law, the law itself doesn't have a dial. It's, it's not like one... Now I'm going to date myself. It's not like one of those Star Trek phasers, okay, where you can set it to stun, you know, with a really cheap and cheesy sound effects to go with it. Anyway, I'm an old school James T. Kirk kind of guy, you know. Anyway, uh, <laughs> But I remember the Star Trek phaser, you know, you'd set it to stun and what would happen is, is that, you know, you'd fire that thing off and somebody would get hit by it and they would just fall, they would go fall and go to sleep. This is not how the law works. And so I, there's no way to set a dial on it. So when the preaching of the law goes out, it's going to result in death occurring within you, not because the law is bad, but because you are sinful and the law then has, is, becomes a means by which our sinful nature just rises up and dies. It's, it's, it's a fascinating thing how this works. But the other thing is, is that God's law for the Christian, for the new man that you are in Christ, when you hear God's law, you're going to sit there and go, you know, that's a really good idea for me. That, that really helps me. And that's where the Spirit then is using the law to reveal to you what a good work is. And the nice thing is, is that when the law 
is doing that, when the Holy Spirit is doing that through the law, showing you what a good work is, and you're sitting there going, yeah, that would be a really good idea, then you'll know that the, the Spirit is at work, number one, sanctifying you, because yeah, Scripture says it is God's will for your sanctification. But also then you have confidence that what God's law has, shall we say, inspired you to do as a good work, that you have confidence that that is a good work. You don't have to invent your good works. I always find it fascinating when people try to invent good works. They come up with these really bizarre ideas. Now, I, I like to pick on Roman. I'm sorry, Mike, I like to do that. But you, know, you, you think about some of the good works that they've invented. You know, uh, So it's, it's a good work then if you make a pilgrimage to Rome. You can still, I think the Pope still has it as an open thing where you can get a plenary indulgence for making a pilgrimage to Rome. And if you uh, visit Rome, in, uh, in Rome itself, they claim that they have the exact same stairs that Jesus stepped up on, these stone, the stone stairs that he stepped up on when he was uh, on trial. And I think it's called the Scalia. And Rome says that if you, if you ascend these stairs on your knees and every step you stop and you pray an Our Father and a Hail Mary all the way up, all the way down, then you also earn a plenary indulgence and you get time off of purgatory. Okay, now I'm going to note something here then, is, and, and you'll note that how does climbing the scalia on my knees and saying an Our Father and a Hail Mary, how is that a good work? How does that help my neighbor? It doesn't. This is a man-made commandment centering around a man-made doctrine regarding purgatory, regarding this man-made concept that somehow Christ's death isn't sufficient and that you know it his death really only covers you know so much and then the rest is kind of up to you and it's up to you to make yourself to cleanse yourself and to purge off your sinful nature and that somehow visiting Rome and climbing the scalia these are a good work before the the the, the eyes of Christ and then back in the time of the Reformation, you can think about people who would travel to different cathedrals or to different castles where uh, either the cathedral or one of the local uh, dukes or you know, members of royalty or whatever had collected particular relics. And going and visiting and seeing those relics, saying a particular prayer, and of course always giving a little bit of money, um, would result again in more time off of purgatory. You know, how, how is it that going to a cathedral and looking at their art collection of relics and visibly beholding the knuckle bone of St. Anne, how is that a good work? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that Opus Dei is a thing still to this day. Oh, yeah, Opus Dei it still exists to this day. Right. Yes, they would terribly treat their body. And this is what Luther did when he was in the monastery. I mean, he, he engaged in that same type of self-flagellation, of actually whipping his body with a whip, you know, which does not sound fun to me at all. I didn't even like to be spanked as a child. So. <laughs> right. And you'll note that all of that is kind of based upon this concept of a spirit of fear. You know, I, I hope I've done enough to be saved. Yes? Isn't it, it seems like it undercuts the sufficiency of Christ. Yes, indeed. In that I know, uh, Jesus died for everybody, but I know how bad I am. I need a little extra. I mean, he probably took care of 99% of it, but it's going to take me 50 yeah. years yeah. of feeding myself to yeah. get rid of that extra 1%. Yeah, I'm, I'm a special case, you know. You know. <laughs> so then you're glorifying your sin. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 in... I would point out that the Apostle Paul, uh, before he was the Apostle Paul, was Saul of Tarshish. And I mean, if there ever was a special case, okay, that, would re- that, that Christ's grace was not sufficient and that he needed to hedge his bets and add a little extra to what Christ did for him on the cross, it would have been Paul. And coming back to the main point then is, is that Paul, at the end of his life, he's got all the blue chips on Jesus. Yeah, he's bet everything on the gospel. 
and not sufficient. And he continues and insists that he has received his salvation as a gift, that it is given as a gift, and it is. So you'll note then that uh, the main theme then of the sermon today is putting our works in a proper perspective. And so James, in his epistle, says, Just as the body that is not breathing is dead. Dead, 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 doobie doobie dead. If, if, that, if that body cannot fog a mirror, it's, it's a corpse. In the same way, then, faith without works is dead. Which then should you know, ask, have you asking the question, What's a good work? How do I go and find out what them is? Because the, the, the third use of the law is it shows us what a good work is. Now, that being the case, consider this commandment. You shall stand up before the gray head and honor the face of an old man. You shall fear your God, I am Yahweh. <laughs> right? Christ came to fulfill the law, I'm staying seated. Uh-huh. No, the point is this, is that this is an extension of the fourth commandment. Okay, honor your father and mother. But you're going to note something. American society, for the most part, I am convinced, is a youth cult. It really is. I mean, what happened to all the beautiful starlets from the 80s? Where are they now? Nobody pays any attention to them at all. It's, it's always the new crop of the, the young, the pretty, the beautiful, the, the bright, the shiny, right? Until they're no longer bright and shiny. And then I always find it fascinating, you know, when you're, you're on a news site and they have the clickbait at the bottom of the, of the page. You know, where are they now, right? And, and so they get people to click on the link where they show, you know, the picture of such and such beautiful starlet who was in the movies in the 80s and where is she now and you you cl- you're, you're looking at this because you want to see what the train wreck of time has done right it's, it's kind of a morbid we all do this i've done it maybe is it just me <laughs> right of course we click on it. <laughs> of course we click on it right okay oh how the mighty have indeed we are but missed so <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It does. It takes like fifty clicks and ten thousand ads to actually yes. get to it. But and you go through every every one of them. Yes, yeah. I want to see that one that was on the picture. <laughs> yeah, we do it. Okay, but I will. Yes, Mike. When did the early church start getting off? You will help with Okay, um, I wouldn't say it was the early church. So, um, when you read the, the writings of the church fathers, all the way up, you know, it's like Gregory the Great. By the way, have you read the theology of Gregory the Great? He is called the Great for a reason. This man was a brilliant theologian. I don't think there is a single modern day theologian that can hold a candle to his understanding of Scripture. But you're going to note what happens is, is that Christianity is a thoroughgoing, healthy, Christ-centered thing. And what happens is, is that after Gregory the Great, there's kind of a rumbling. You can start to see it showing up in the writings about his period, a little bit before him, and then after him, it gets a full head of steam with the rise of Islam. And the issue was, is that how do you organize such a growing organization as the church when you don't have one visible person at, you know, calling the shots at the top. And so there was already, at the, before the time of Gregory, a growing group of people who were calling for uh, the primacy of the seat of Peter, you know, the primacy of the Bishop of Rome. But back in the old day, that was completely impossible. Here's the reason why, is because there were many papas. There were particular regions within the Mediterranean where there were strong bishops and, and their sees were really, really uh, wielded a lot of power. For instance, you think of the Bishop of Ephesus, you think of the Bishop of Antioch, you think of the Bishop of Alexandria, all right, and also the Bishop of Jerusalem. These men were constantly bickering with each other politically because where two or more are gathered, there's politics. Um, I don't know if you've noticed that. Uh, <laughs> but the thing is, is that they kind of kept each other in check. 
And so, you know, somebody would say, I think, you know, we need to have the primacy of, uh, of the Bishop of Rome because he's the, he, you know, he, he holds the See of Peter. And the, and the Bishop of Alexandria, who's also called a Papa, he was also called a Pope, would say, over my dead body, you know, that good for nothing, whatever, you know, and, and they were bickering and fighting and, and, and all this. This is what they did. You, it's clearly in the, in the writings of the Church Fathers. Even, you know, post-Augustine, you know, at the, at the time of and beyond Gregory the Great, and there were, there were even bishops of Rome who were arguing against the primacy of Peter's see, and one particular, po- it may have been even Gregory, if I'm remembering this correctly, said that if you were to make the bishop of Rome primary, then you would establish the office of Antichrist. That was Gregory. Okay? So what was the thing that changed everything? The thing that changed everything was the rise of Islam. Because Islam Islam rises up, it takes out Alexandria, takes out Jerusalem, takes out Antioch. Ephesus as a city uh, started drifting farther and farther inland as the silt built up and it, it was no longer a port city. It lost its appeal and its strength as as a city that the bishop of ephesus totally like you know that the city practically went to ruin to pod and and with the rise of islam and all of that you had basically two guys left and you got the bishop of rome you've got the bishop of constantinople and those guys kind of duked it out. And then with the great schism, you know, that occurred with the splitting of the East and the West, which really, if you kind of think about it, was a natural thing to have happen because the East was so much more influenced by particular theologians in the West. The East and West had very different mindsets, even in how they did theology. And it's with that vacuum of power, then you see the ascendancy of the Bishop of Rome within the Catholic West. And... Um, from there, you start to see just standard theological doctrinal creep, you know. And the same thing's happening in, in e- evangelicalism right now. I mean, it's just happening a lot faster. I mean, the evangelicalism I grew up in m- made a concerted effort at least to attempt to back up their doctrines from Scripture. Nowadays, people are just making stuff up, all right? And so the same you know, uh, you know, tendency towards apostasy and false doctrine that we're seeing in evangelicalism, that's the same thing that we saw going on in Rome. And, you know, and so you're going to have to put that really into, uh, historically, the context. It's not in the early church. It's more really, at, it's, it, it starts to build up a head of steam in the early part of the Middle Ages and comes to a full head then at the time of the Reformation. But I would, I would note this, that, that uh, the Rome that we know today did not exist in the time of Luther. It was a sect of, of the Catholic Church. And, uh, and that within the Catholic Church visible, even at the time of Luther, there were places that you could still go to hear the gospel. You, you still could. The, the church never slipped out into complete apostasy. And what ended up happening is, is that the, the, the Reformation was an attempt to truly reform the Catholic Church, and get her back to sound doctrine and to pair off all of these extra man-made things that had come up. And what ended up happening is, is that a large piece of, of Rome split off with the Reformation, especially after the excommunic- excommunication of Martin Luther. And, uh, and so what, uh, what I would say the more careful historians and theologians recognize is that the, the Lutheran Reformation is a Western confession within the Church Catholic. And it actually represents um, a theology that never was fully extinguished, even in the time of the, uh, in the, time of the Re- uh, before the Reformation. Uh, but that being the case, um, you, know, you, 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 you don't think about Catholic in terms of Rome, because the, the, even the phrase, Roman Catholic, this is an oxymoron. All right? the, the Catholic Church is the universal church. And so, you know, this, this is not a, a way to think, but the, the Rome as we know it today, um, and I have to make a caveat because it's morphed again after Vatican II, but Rome as we know it today, you know, the, the really hardcore indulgences, works righteousness and everything like that, that was not formally you know, set in stone as dogma until the Council of Trent. And now post-Trent, no pope can actually change the edicts of the Council of Trent. In the Council of Trent, they anathematized the gospel itself. 
And so that's when Rome doubles down and solidifies their doctrine of, of salvation by works. And it's, it's clearly shown in the Council of Trent. And a good read would be Martin Chemnitz's book. It's a four-volume uh, work called Examination of the Council of Trent by Martin Chemnitz. It's not an inexpensive set of books, but man, is it worth the read. Chemnitz knew his stuff, and he was an expert in the writings of the Church Fathers. And so Martin Chemnitz's books, the, you know, On Examination of the Council of Trent, walks you through literally the decisions that were made in, in the Council of Trent, what was wrong with those decisions, and he backs it up from Scripture as well as the writings of the earliest Church Fathers. And so you, you get the idea. But that, that's the place to go. So what happens is, is that that sets in stone the course for Rome until Vatican II. And, and now Vatican II, they've loosened up on some of that stuff. But the issue is, is that uh, Roman Catholic policy makes it impossible for them to overturn uh, the, the anathemas of the Council of Trent. So rather than getting rid of them, what they've pretty much done is kind of cover them up, paper over them, mute them a little bit. And, and so Roman Catholics today, they bemoan the state of the Roman Catholic Church presently, and uh, the, the purists within uh, Rome look longingly back to the days prior to Vatican II. Because um, it's... The, the post-Vatican II, Rome is a sh- mere shadow of what it used to be. Mere shadow. But it's still a works-based religion, but it's got this kind of squishy, weird kind of universalism that's just right underneath the surface of it, that's just there. So, yeah. And that's been a big problem for the last generation, is yeah. defanging the Council of Trent. It yeah. took away their ability to... You'll get these cells of apostasy or embedded sin, like yeah. Boston. yeah. You know, and it's much harder for them to crack the whip and pull them into line. Right. So even in so far as they have an imperfect understanding of the gospel, they've taken away their ability to enforce it yep. in order to prevent the next religious war. Right. Now a little bit of a note here. Before we get all, you know, it's like, well, they've defanged, you know, Trent and you know, and, and, and bemoaning. I can't think of a single, and I mean this, a single ecclesiastical Christian visible organization on the planet. That, can, that effectively deals with false doctrine right now or even has the, the ability to do so. We're in weird days. I mean, you know, we're just in strange days. And you, you look at what happened to the ELCA. Where was the power to stop that apostasy? The, what's funny is, is that I'll note this, when you do a case study on the ELCA, it's the apostates within the ELCA who didn't focus on doctrine. They focused on how to exert power. They became the best at Robert's rules of order and using the mechanisms of power for the purpose of changing uh, the church and the evacuating of it of sound doctrine and even the law. But that is the doctrine of the social gospel. Right? Uh, yeah, it's all about the power. The social gospel is... Jesus is a good metaphor for communism and hugs. Mm-hmm. So it's all about earthly power. So yep. that do- doctrine is then, if Jesus is about earthly power, then bringing about your vision of justice is righteousness. That is their doctrine. Oh, I know. Yeah, and they'll, and they'll squash anybody in the name of Jesus in pursuing it. You know. And, and so a lot of the AALC pastors, the, the old guard who were who were there when they left, they jumped ship out of the, you know, the newly formed ELCA. The stories they tell are absolutely horrifying of how their bishops would call them into secret meetings and basically say, you're going to stop preaching the sin and repentance stuff or we're going to get rid of you. It wasn't even, it wasn't even veiled. There, there was no velvet glove over the iron fist. It was just pure iron-fisted exertion of power. Yeah. Well, and then many congregations um, that want to leave the ELCA, they can't. Um, they don't necess- a lot of them don't own, actually own their property. Yep. And so they hold that over. So fine, you know, you can, you know, you can leave the ELCA, but the building belongs to us. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, just lock the doors, send us the key, and, you know, have a good day. 
Fascinating, isn't it? Dominion of darkness, how it works. Um, we, recent, we recently, there was a congregation that wanted to join the AALC, and that was the exact tactic that they used. Yeah. Uh, and as a result, they you know, haven't left. Know, 60, 70 percent of the congregation left. Yeah. Um, yeah. But like you said, it's every. Church it's it's body. every church yeah. body. I've had an LCMS pastor telling me to my face. Well, as soon as I got out of seminary, I had to relearn everything they taught me there so mm-hmm. I could do real ministry. And he's still practicing. I'm not going to name names, but that was his direct quote. And he's still ordained, and yeah. they're still giving him calls. You know, I, 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 and I love my, my brothers who are confessional Lutherans within the Missouri Synod, but I, I always find it fascinating when I have other confessional Lutheran pastors in other confessional bodies who say to me things like, why is the AALC in fellowship with the LCMS? They are heterodox at best. And they seem to have almost zero, and I mean this, like zero desire or will to crack down on the bona fide heretics within their, within their ecclesiastical body. But it's like I said, this is everywhere. Yeah. So where is the power of the Holy Spirit in this era? It's in the preaching of the gospel. I I guess, you know, maybe it's just a... um, I I just want the Holy Spirit to just set things right. But Christ will. But now, 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 now in the future. Maranatha, you're going to note then that this this is not something new. The church as an organization has always been weak, Mm -hmm. corrupt, in one way or another, dealing with bona fide false teaching, false prophecies, false whatever. I mean, even it was Augustine who said that the road to hell is paved with the skulls of priests, with the mile markers being the skulls of bishops. That was Augustine in his day. All right? Is anything different today? But here's the thing. So what comes to us then in weakness? What comes to us and the confession that we make that Christ has saved us, bled and died for all of our sins, this confession that we make, we, you'll note then that the gospel, you, you can't waterboard somebody with the gospel. It comes to us in rejectable means. The word of God, the waters of baptism, even the sacraments, you know, the Lord's Supper, in, in the absolution. And the men who preach this gospel, dang, they're all messed up. Like, me first, right? Okay. And, and, and the organization that we're a part of, is, is the AALC like the epitome of like clockwork, how to run a, a, a Christian? <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, like not at all. In fact, yesterday at our, at our uh, we had a, a meeting of the uh, North Plains region of the ALC, and I said that the, the ALC's organization is as effective as the way the Confederate States of America were organized, you know. It, but it's, I'm sorry, I stand by my evaluation, <laughs> okay? And it's, this is most certainly true. So here's the thing. What comes to us right now in weakness, don't worry. When Jesus shows up, everything flips, and everything gets seen for what it is. You see, we recognize the strength of Christ and the gospel not because Christ is out there flexing real muscle and taking on the evildoers and slaying them. (laughs) Okay, that day is coming, right? But right now, Jesus comes to us humbly. He comes to us in the words of a sinful man, preaching his word. He comes to us in ordinary tap water from Minnesota. He comes to us in bread and wine, and even sometimes breadcrumbs, depending on if we have enough wafers left. <laughs> That's, sorry, inside baseball there. <laughs> if you know the joke, you know the joke, right? And he comes to us in wine, comes to us in the absolution, and here we are out in the middle of the sugar beet fields, and it just, does this look like a powerful kingdom place to you at all? No. And the people who come here, including the pastor, hear the word of God and call us to repent. 
the law of God killing us, evacuating us of our self-righteousness, and all of us being humbled and brought to our knees, and receiving these gifts from our Savior who right now has not chosen to act in glory, but instead chosen to come to us humbly. And so we're buffeted, we're made to suffer, we're persecuted, we're slandered. And is our experience any different than the generation before us, or the generation before them, or the generation before them? This, it's the parade of those who have taken up their cross, denied themselves, and are following Christ to their death. And see, this is where, where the, and this is where the difference is. All these other religions are somehow trying to figure out how we can maneuver it so that we can use God's power to have an amazing, excellent, devil-slaying life now. Well, it, so much for that, because the church gets to be pursued by the devil in the wilderness, the dragon pursuing the church. And if it were not for the miraculous intervention of Christ, we would be overcome by him. So we come to church, we confess that we're sinners, we receive the absolution, we hear the word, rightly preached, law and gospel, we're called to repent again, return to our baptismal faith, we receive the body and blood of Christ, and then we go out and we get the snot kicked out of us again by the devil, by the world, by our own sinful flesh, and so we come into church limping, bleeding, bruised. I don't know. I haven't seen you guys parading in here in victory lately. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so what are we? We're already dead. And we're also already alive. We're just waiting for our bodies to catch up. There's a new world coming. And when Christ shows up, everything that you're longing for will finally come. I assure you, there will be no heretics. None in the new earth. There will be no sin in the new earth. Not in me, not in you. We will finally know what it really means to experience loving one another. Could you imagine a friendship that doesn't have all the static of sin in it? Or a family relationship that doesn't have all the static of sin in it? Or how about a, you know, well, there's no marriage in the new earth. So, you know, I don't, again, stay tuned. I have no idea how the relationships work out that way. But, uh, you know, but could you imagine having a relationship with somebody of the opposite sex where there's no static of sin in it? No fear, no anxiety, not, no abuse, no ridiculously stupid fights with towering, raging, yelling, and screaming, and the roof flying off the building over nothing. None of that, right? That's coming. But right now, if Christ were to flex all of his mu muscle and get rid of all the evildoers, we're in trouble. <laughs> Me first, <laughs> right? So you, you kind of get the idea. There's, there's, a, there's a wisdom behind what Christ is doing. There really is, and it's a kindness, and it's a mercy, but it means that finding a church that truly confesses what Scripture says, preaches the gospel, rightly administers the sacrament, it'll always be a challenge, and it always has been. Even in the days of the apostles, the apostles dealt with the same kind of nonsense. Have you ever read like Third John? I mean, it's, it's a short little letter, but there's a funny little detail in it that I just, that just cracks me up. Okay, Third John, not a very long one. Third John, here we go. <laughs> I'll read it out just because it's, you know, it's just a terse little letter, but it's fun. To the elder, to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Yeah, notice, I love him in the truth. So note, who's writing this? The Apostle John. This is the guy who we know because of the way he wrote about himself Unlike the other, the other gospel writers, he made it clear, if you read between the lines, he's the disciple whom Jesus loved, right? Oh, and he's also the guy who happened to beat Peter to the tomb in, in the race to get there. You could just see Peter going, 
<laughs> of course. Just the sort of thing a teenager would remember. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, he's the youngest of the disciples. And of course, he beats middle aged Peter. Well, Way to go. Don't you know, like nowadays when they have marathons and stuff, they divide people up by age group, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, so, but uh, the elder whom I, uh, the, to the elder, uh, the beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth, beloved, I pray that all may go well with you, that you may be in good health as it goes well in your soul. I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. Have you considered just the fact that why would Gaius need brothers to come and testify to the truth if the truth itself was not under attack, right? I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth, which means there's a whole lot of people who ain't, okay? Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all of your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God, For they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. Now, I've written something to the church, but Diotrephus, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. Okay, work with me for a second here. Okay, John. All right. This is a fellow who is the eyewitness of a resurrection of Jesus. He was there when Christ bled and died, watched him expire on the cross. In fact, not only was he there, Jesus says to John, John, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. He gets the honor of caring for Mary, the mother of Christ. He, after Paul establishes and plants the church in Ephesus, church history tells us, traveled with Mary to Ephesus and basically had the, you know, what was the bishop of Ephesus as an apostle. He, this is the man who catechized, catechized Polycarp. I mean, his credentials are impeccable. Who is this Diotrephus fellow? Because Diotrephus doesn't recognize the authority of the Apostle John? Are you kidding me? Where? In the church. And listen to what this fellow does. He likes to put himself first. He doesn't acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stop those who want to and puts them out of the church. Who is this Yahoo? Has anything changed? No. Nothing's changed. If they didn't, if there were people in the visible church who didn't recognize the authority of the apostle John and put people out of the church who did, and note this, in the name of Jesus, because they never act, want to make it clear that they're acting on their own authority, who are we to expect anything different? Do people in the church today as a whole recognize the authority of faithful pastors? No, and I need not remind you that you know that from personal experience. Of course not. Do faithful pastors today experience the same kind of thing where people speak wicked nonsense against them? Yep. And again, I don't need to remind you, you know that personally. Why should we expect anything different? So the church today appears humble, weak, bruised, beaten, battered. And it is. But there's a day coming when Christ who comes to us humbly right now through means The day of God's grace and his mercy will end. This is the day that we find ourselves in today. 
The day when God makes his appeal to sinful humanity through men who are sinful, who proclaim to them the forgiveness of sins in Christ, who are then mistreated and slandered and abused and even put out of the church. And there's a day coming when they will be vindicated who have been put out of the church and those who, acting on their own authority and contrary to the expressed will of God and his word, they will have no power. They will go into eternity in the lake of fire, nameless. They will have no name. And we, each and every one of us, will be given a personal name from Christ himself whom nobody else will not even know. Not only are our names written in the Lamb's Book of Life, but each and every one of us will have a unique name given to us by Christ himself. So, today's the day of humble things. Today we suffer. Today we take up our cross. Today we die. It's loads of fun. You should embrace it as a, as a joy and a privilege. It seems a little hard though, yeah. But while we want the church made right, right now, and I'm kind of interested in seeing the fireworks that are involved in that process, um, <laughs> <Blood>. the, <laughs> the Peter tells us why it's good to wait. Mm -hmm. Right. Right? When he says God's not willing for any to perish, but yeah. they're all yeah. he's being patient so as many people as possible yeah. can. Yeah. That yeah. helps me endure yeah. these cruddy days before yeah. the coming of Christ. Yeah. 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 It, it's an oxymoron. We want right to happen, but we want salvation to yeah. be there for yeah. those yeah. who yeah. need it. And see here's the thing. If you were to try to flex political muscle for the purpose of making everything right in the church, you would be doubly a child of hell in doing so. Well, here in America, because the church descended from the Puritans, like, they quote them. A <laughs> yeah, lot. Don't do that. <laughs> what? <laughs> Sorry, the irony wasn't lost on me. Go right. ahead. We're both from Celtic nations. Yeah. We lost over 20% of our population to those self righteous butchers. Right. You know, you didn't pray in our language, die. You didn't pray out of our prayer book, die. die. You know, and those yeah. are the people that the American church, the evangelical, American evangelical church looks to as its church fathers. They go to their writings, they, they praise them in public. I was just doing a sermon review yesterday, and one of these guys started praising him, and I thought, what the roof? I'm like, 20,000 people of my Celtic tribe dead in a week. That's the Puritans. Yeah. You know, and, and we can't be more prideful if we try to enforce our version of righteousness. Yeah. Where would we pile the bodies of the people who wouldn't bow to and, and the Lutherans are not, are not without blood on their hands. I mean, you think of the Thirty Years' War. There were Lutherans who baptized Calvinists for a good ten minutes until the bubble stopped. Okay. It's terrible. <laughs> oh, can we do confession for you? <laughs> okay. Here's the thing. None of us are guiltless in this. None of us are. So it comes back to, you know, I, I, I'll start with the fruit of the Spirit. Listen to what the fruit of the Spirit is. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. What did, what did Paul say in our epistle text from last week? Pursue gentleness. You know, it, everything in this world and in our own sinful nature is geared towards the exertion of power for the purpose of personal gain of one kind or another. But the gospel says to empty yourself to deny yourself. And in so doing, then you receive love, forgiveness, mercy, gentleness, grace, compassion from God. Having received that, rather than getting what you deserve, which is hell, you get pardon and grace. That then flavors how I serve you. I do not come to you in power. 
I come to you in gentleness. I do not come to you demanding my rights. I come to you instead, saying Christ has bled and died for you. I'm your servant, I'm your slave. I'm called to love you, even to love the loveless. Right? And what happens? The self-righteous, those who want to exert power and be like the devil where it's all about me. I exalt me. I exalt me. (laughs) Right? They hate this. You want me to do what? No. And so you can see the collision. It's the collision between fear, selfish ambition, exertion of power, abuse, malice, slander, versus gentleness, loving kindness, peace, and self-control. And who always ends up on the, the, on the bottom with those lists? The humble. Those who love. And yet, here's the thing. When we listen to the word of God and believe it, then we recognize that those who are on the top today are actually on the bottom. Those who are on the bottom today are in reality on the top. Because sin has so disoriented us that we do not even have a proper understanding of what's up and what's down, what's black and what's right. Those who are dead in sins call evil good, and they call good evil. But the only way to get a right orientation is to hear what God says and go, you know what, he's right, I'm wrong. He's telling the truth. Everything within me and everything in the world, they're actually wrong. And you sit there and go, well, man, who am I to say that? It sounds awful arrogant. All right? It's not. It's actually, to, it's to be humble. Huh? Ongoing. Yeah, and ongoing. We're just, we're just sent. Yeah. We're just the messenger. I didn't think. <laughs> right. So, Yeah. So before we get all down on other church bodies, let's recognize we're all screwed up, okay? Everybody's got the same challenge. And I'll be blunt. I know Roman Catholic priests who preach the gospel. I know them. I know Anglican priests who preach the gospel. I've met them. I've had meals with them. And I know a bunch of people who are even within so-called confessional Lutheran church bodies who wouldn't be able to identify the gospel if I were to put a Mardi Gras hat on him and some streamers and a spotlight and say, this is the gospel, they'd go, I don't know what you're talking about. And that's been the state of affairs all the way back. I mean, diatrophies, putting people out of the church, didn't recognize the authority of the Apostle John. Can you say dunderhead? You know, what on earth is this? Right? And you'll note then that even the Apostle John, he doesn't say, I want you to pull out your flaming sword and cut his head off, make sure that you scourge him with the cat of nine tails and set an example to him of what happens to evildoers who do such things. Right? So we'll continue. So I've written something to the church, Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, doesn't acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I'll bring up what he's doing. (laughs) We're going to have a chat about this. He's talking with (laughs) wicked nonsense against us. Not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. So beloved, do not imitate evil. Imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. I had much to write to you, but I'd rather not write with the pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we'll talk face to face. So is there any solution offered other than, yeah, if I show up, I I hope to be able to sit down and have a chat with him. (laughs) 
<laughs> I wonder how that conversation went. I wonder if it took place. I don't know. Right? But you get a note here that for somebody who wielded apostolic authority, and John did, it didn't seem high on his priority list to put down the evildoer <laughs> instead, but to try to reason with him and have a conversation with him. And then his, his admonishment to us is, don't imitate evil. Don't. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. Love is patient. Love is kind. Doesn't envy or boast. Doesn't insist on its own way. Love endures all things, hopes all things. Yes, you, you see? Right? Even John didn't imitate evil. He wanted to serve Diotrephus. And see if he can appeal to him to repent. And so, are, do we have more authority than John did in the church? I don't have that much authority. <laughs> you, know, you know what I have the authority to do, by the way? I have the authority to forgive your sins. I have the authority to preach the word to you. I have the authority to baptize. I have the authority to give you Christ's body and blood. The end. <laughs> right? I also have the authority to bind the sins of the impenitent. But I don't have the authority to act on my own recognizance to do so. There's a whole lot of steps before the office of the binding key is used. And a whole lot of patience goes into that process and a whole lot of people are involved. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. When did the, like the Catholic Church, when did they get into, um, they, they threw out love they did when they started burning people and stuff? Where, where did that come from? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I am glad that you recognize burning your neighbor at the stake is the opposite of loving your neighbor. And, <laughs> and I would also note this, that, um, that the, it, it's, a, it's a complicated answer, and it doesn't have a singular answer to it. But the seedbed of this comes with what's, uh, what people call Constantinianism, where there is no proper distinction between church and state. And so what happens is, is that when the Roman Catholic Church acts as a, as a worldly government and it then seeks to punish in the way that the state, is, uh, the governments are called to punish, and it punishes what it perceives as its enemies, those whom he, he has labeled as heretics, and sometimes they rightly label somebody as a heretic, but still, the church does not have this authority. And so what happens is, is that when the church uses the authority of the left-hand kingdom, the government for the purpose of punishing the evildoer, now we've got a real problem because the church is way off topic. Okay, The church has the authority to make disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching all that Christ has commanded. This is what the church has the authority to do. The church does not have the authority to burn at the stake evildoers. When the church is doing that, it ceases to be church and it's turned into a left-hand kingdom government. And that's where the problem lies. So, yeah. And that really got confused with the whole idea of a state church, which permeated yeah. Western Europe or and yeah. also Eastern Europe. Yeah. Just to give a little bit of background, of our own church history here, going back to our ancestors who are out there, and 400 years prior to that, uh, when we recently visited Scandinavia, and particularly Finland, which is the source of some of our ancestors, if you go back to the 1400s, those folks were caught in a ge geopolitical bind between the rest of Scandinavia and Russia. Yeah. So over a period of a couple hundred years, they were Catholics, Russian Orthodox, and went through Reformation Lutherans, and then they migrated to Sweden. Norway became Haugian Lutherans after a while, mm -hmm. came over here. So uh, with that state church influence, they went through Big Catholics, Orthodox, Lutherans, and various stages of Lutheranism. Yeah. And some of them, and throw in the background mix of pagan spiritism, which didn't totally disappear. Yeah. And you can actually 
if you look hard enough, find some signs of that even today. Yep. Yeah. And, and I would note that this first manifests itself right in the generation after Constantine. Let, let me explain. So with, with the legalization of Christianity uh, via Constantine, um, Christianity went from being a persecuted church to being kind of the in vogue religious movement of the day. Constantine himself uh, was present at the Council of Nicaea, which was totally out of bounds, completely out of bounds. I'm sorry, but the head of state has nothing to say or to participate in an ecclesiastical matter deter- to convene to determine what is orthodoxy, a belief in the doctrine of the Trinity, or belief in uh, Arius's heresy. But yet Constantine was there. And so Constantine, you know, as a practically uncatechized observer, is a participant in it. And what ends up happening is, is that the, the, the Eastern Roman Empire, which really is now the whole seat of power within Rome after the fall of uh, Rome itself, to the Visigoths and others, but the, it now Rome is getting involved in ecclesiastical matters, so much so that upon the death of Constantine, his son takes the throne. His son believes the Arian heresy and uses the power of the empire for the purpose of persecuting and punishing those who proclaim the doctrine of the Trinity. And it was the son of Constantine who sent soldiers to arrest Athanasius of Alexandria. Okay? And the story is actually hilarious. It's one of my favorite stories about Athanasius. Athanasius is like one of my heroes. Um, so Athanasius, you know, got wind that, uh, that the emperor had sent soldiers to arrest him. People warned him that, that, was, that he, his life was in danger. And he, uh, I think he had to finish uh, a, a mass and uh, finishing the Mass, he skedaddled out after he got his vestments off, was able to get on a, on a sailing barge, you know, heading uh, you know, up, the, uh, up the Nile and, uh, the, with the soldiers in hot pursuit. And um, they got in their own sailing ship, and they weren't sure which boat Athanasius was in, but they knew that he was traveling up the Nile. And there, the soldier's ship, you know, was getting closer and closer and closer and closer, and Athanasius thought, oh, this is it, I'm... I'm going to be arrested. And the, the ship pulls alongside of them, and the soldiers say, we're looking for Athanasius of Alexandria. Have you seen him? And he said, yes, yes, yes. He's up ahead. Just a few boats up. I thought I saw him. And they said, thank you. And <laughs> kept going. <laughs> he lied through his teeth to save his own skin, right? And we'll note that David did the same, so we'll, we won't fault him for that. But yeah, so the, so the issue comes in is, is that with, with the legalization of Christianity, then there, there is an ongoing confusion of church and state, and especially then in what would become the, known as the medieval Roman, Holy Roman Empire, there is no distinction between church and state. They're so intermingled that at the time of the Reformation then, uh, back and forth, you see that if the monarch is Roman Catholic, those who are following the doctrines of the Reformation are being persecuted and put to death, burned at the stake. And then, as if that's not bad enough, well, now you've got a Protestant monarch, and now the, the persecution goes the other way. And how many hundreds of thousands of people are in their graves as a result of this nonsense, a failure to distinguish the proper distinction between the state and the church. So, I'm over time. We'll pick up next week. You got me on a rant. (laughs) I blame you.